Zero NTV and welcome back to the shack and to another homebrew video and um, this one's a bit different um, because uh, well it all started with Asha Farhan who uh, VU2ESE who uh, many of us I'm sure know very well created the Bitex amongst many other things and recently put two new transceiver schematics up on his website. One was for a, an SDR, the other was completely different, was for an all analog uh, transceiver, which used what he called a permeability tuned oscillator, a PTO. Now there's nothing new about this, Collins used to use them in their, their transceivers uh, of old, um, but essentially, if you think of an analog VFO, generally speaking, what you would normally do, at least all the ones I've built in the past, is you would have a fixed amount of inductance and then you'd have a variable capacitor and you, that's how you tune. You, you tune the capacitor and that would vary the frequency. But in a PTO, you have a fixed capacitance and you vary the inductance. And uh, now, Farhan did it by by actually uh, 3D printing a little plastic former which, which had his, his coil on, and then he had a, a brass screw which you screwed in and out of the uh, of, of the coil, and that varied the inductance. Um, now, the reason I got interested in all of this is really thanks to Bill Mira, N2CQR of Solder Smoke fame. He uh, did some stuff on this and he picked up on this this brilliant idea that, that somebody else had had to um, to to homebrew this this same variable inductor but using different methods specifically using a glue stick or a chapstick or a lipstick even but one of these things you know which which has a kind of rotatable knob there and will move uh, something up um, and down, but actually doesn't stick out. It's not like a, a, a brass screw that goes in and out. Uh, it, it just turns that way and that way. Um, but it actually does something physical inside. It moves it, and um, so it's quite interesting. So uh, Bill had a go at uh, uh, building some of these and, and had some success. I thought, oh, I, I need to kind of do this. So I was I was instantly hooked on this idea of of using a, a glue stick. Um, uh, as the former of a, of a variable uh, inductor, so um, so if you're interested, keep watching. Right, well, welcome to the kitchen this time. Uh, now, when I first heard about this, when Bill posted about this idea, I was so excited. I went off to Amazon and ordered a box of twelve, <laughs> so I knew I'd be making a few of them. And so here they are. So they weren't very expensive. Um, so this is the, the screw uh, bit, and this is the cap. Um, so the first thing you do is you pop the cap off and you just screw the glue stick all the way out. Um, but I would advise you, um, if it's, I mean, all, I guess they're all slightly different designs, but um, to, to don't do it over the bin, otherwise you're gonna be um, putting your hands in the bin, because on mine at least, they have a little, um, plate that fits over the um, uh, uh, the, the the screw uh, the, the 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 shaft through the middle, um, and the plate is attached to the actual glue. So actually, I ended up putting the whole lot in the bin. <laughs> so uh, let me show you uh, what it, I actually mean. Um, so yeah, so here is um, the actual thing. Uh, once you've uh, you've got the glue out of it, and I actually soaked the the casing as well, and got the label off, and then went over it with some um, duct tape, and just uh, to get any sticky bits off the side. So it looks nice. Um, this is the bit I'm talking about. So this, the glue was on here, was was coming out here. And this was on the end, and this is the bit that screws into that uh, 
uh, that shaft there. Um, so you need this because this is the bit that you're going to attach your uh, your toroids to. Um, yeah, and then this is just the cap that goes on the end. Um, so those um, are the bits um, uh, that you need. Uh, so uh, it's really not that messy because the glue comes out in one, one go really. It's just cleaning up um, this bit. And you don't have to take all the stuff off the side. It's just I'm a bit OCD really. So I did. Um, and once you've done that, uh, you're ready to start building your inductor. Well, welcome to the bench. And uh, you can see I've been busy here. So here is our um, uh, little glue stick. Um, and what I've done is I have uh, wound onto it. Well, first of all, I've put a, a little bit of um, double-sided um, sticky tape. Really, really useful stuff. Um, so just a little bit of that um, uh, across here, if you can see that, uh, just across here, and actually, uh, I've, and secured the ends of my uh, wire. This is the enamel copper wire. I think it's twenty-two gauge, something like that. Um, and uh, just put a couple of cable ties just to, to, to hold it on. Uh, but because of the, uh, the 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 sticky surface, it, it tends to hold its uh, shape pretty well. Um, and uh, done the usual trick of um, just scraping the ends here and uh, and just tinning them. So the 16 turns here, starting from this end, uh, tapped uh, at four turns, and then going through um, uh, to the to the 16th there. Um, and uh, so that's uh, a quite a neat job, really. So that's that's the uh, the, the former. Um, now, inside, what I've been doing is I've got uh, the uh, the little uh, moving um, base plate. Now, I don't know what you can see here, but actually what I've done is I've actually carved away at this centre bit because what, what I did initially is I've got um, uh, type uh, 50, uh, sorry, type six. It's a fifty dash six. Fifty is the um, the diameter, and six is the type. So that's good from um, it's supposed to be good three to uh, forty megahertz. And as I'm going to be using this um, for forty meters, that that'll be fine. Um, so uh, now, if you put it on there, uh, originally it, it would go on there, but it was very tight, so I squashed it down and snapped the toroid in half. <laughs> So you have to be careful with them. So what I did is is actually uh, I've just got to work with a knife. You probably just see, but just hacked away a little bit just to make that the diameter of that centre bit just a bit narrower. And so what I'm then going to do, so this sits in there now without forcing it at all. So I'm going to glue that one in. And then I've got another one because I need uh, more inductance here. And the other one is just going to be glued straight on top of that and then that whole bit then will move up and down um, when you uh, when you, uh, you you turn the knob. Okay, well, I've been busy with the glue. So for the two toroids, I just use super glue to glue one on top of the other. And then to actually glue it into the, um, the little base, I'm going to try and come in here. I don't know whether you're going to be able to see this. Let's see if I can... Uh focus this a bit better that's better you can probably just about see uh, around the sides there's a there's a there's a uh, some little bits of glue attaching the toroid to the, the the walls of the base four blobs of it and they use some of that um uv welding stuff which is superb really um which uh, you know you apply and then you uh, you put a a UV light on it and it sets rock hard instantly. Um, so that's that's great. Um, so uh, so that now will move freely uh, through the uh, the actual former, and uh, and will be a true permeability tuned uh, uh, oscillator eventually when it's it's connected to the oscillator because you, what we're actually doing is we're varying the uh, the inductance. Um, 
but not just by tapping it. We're varying the inductance by changing the permeability uh, of the actual uh, device itself by putting those uh, iron dust toroids um, uh, in and in and out of that actual uh, former. So uh, yeah, there it is. So what I've got then is I've got our glue stick variable inductor and I've got that connected up to the leads of my peak LCR uh, inductance impedance uh, meter. And uh, so I'm going to set the camera down now so you can see uh, what's going on on the meter and I'm going to uh, uh, vary the inductance on the glue stick. Okay, so that's uh, reading uh, 6.64 microhenries. So that's with the uh, with both of those cores um, not uh, engaged uh, in the coil. So fully retracted. So I'm going to uh, start to turn it, and as I turn it, you should see slowly the inductance increasing. So here we go. And uh, it's pretty smooth, and uh, yeah, quite impressed with how it feels. So we're still going up, still going up, and I think we're going to get to about ah, meter's gone off. Wouldn't you know it? Okay, as we were, we we're at two seven point two two. Um, I think we'll get to seven point three four point three three. No, you see seven point three four five. But now, if I keep on going, you'll see it's going down again. So we've we've reached the peak there now. So that's the that's the point of maximum uh, uh, inductance is about 7.34, 7.35 microhenries. Well, here is Farhan's uh, schematic, or at least a part of his schematic. I've just uh, cropped it down. Um, so this is part of his schematic for the Daylight Again transceiver, and this is just the PTO part of that. Um, and uh, so you see it basically the hinges around two uh, J310 uh, FETs. Um, there's a voltage regulator here. He runs his at 5 volts. I think I ran my last one. I started at 5. I, I tried running it a little bit more to see if I'd get any more power out of it. But it, to be honest, it, there wasn't a lot in it really. Um, so I'll probably just stick with the um, uh, with the with the five volts again. I think for this uh, next time. Farhand, when he built his, of course, he has a three D printed former with a brass screw essentially that, that that goes in and out, which obviously we're not doing. But I, when I built the first glue stick variable inductor, I, I adopted the same kind of design considerations in that. Uh, I could see he'd got a tap a quarter of the way through, so that's what I did. So instead of only 40 turns, we've got 16 and uh, tapped at turn four. We'll come back to this because the big question, the big unknown at the moment, is how much capacitance, parallel capacitance, do we need with this variable inductor to tune across the 40 meter band and use it in a, a direct conversion receiver. What I would say while we're looking at this is that there is a, a little um, uh, RF choke here and I've built my own for that and you'll see that on the next uh, diagram I show you. Very good to use quality capacitors. So NP0 C zero G capacitors, ones that have a very stable temperature coefficient, so ones that are not going to start changing their value whether they get 
are warmer or colder. And that's played many uh, a home brew variable frequency oscillator before. So certainly these need to be NP0. This one, this I will put an NP0 there as well, and um, probably one here as well. This one's not so critical because this is really just on the on the the, the VCC line. I will use NP zeros um, just to uh, to try and uh, uh, and keep it as stable as possible. So here is my own little um, design of of how I implemented um, Farhan schematic. Uh, now, obviously, this I did this for the first one I built. Um, so if you look on the right hand side, um, I. I had two random toroids, one was larger than the other, um, and uh, and you'll remember that I had uh, my chunky antenna wire filled the, the hole of the, uh, of the glue stick, basically. But it was done to the same design, 16 turns tapped at four. Uh, now, in the one that I've just built, and, and in the PTO that, that we're building, obviously the windings here, take up less than half of the, the length of it and are all uh, in this section here and um, they're not random toroids we know exactly what they are they're, they're two uh, T50 type 6 so um, this is what it looks like um, it's pretty much as we saw on Farhan's design except obviously we're using the glue stick inductor uh, the choke uh, is here, so I used an FT3743 and just put 10 turns on that, and that's about 33 micro henrys. That works just fine. I'm building it Manhattan style using the uh, the, the 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 me pads uh, that I just glue down. And uh, yes, so now last time. Uh, because my variable inductor would produce between 3.46 and 3.80 microhenry, so a lot less than the, uh, than the one we've just uh, built, that required 135 picofarads of capacitance to tune across the 40 meter band. Now, it will be different this time and even when we do the calculations, in actual fact, it might be a little bit different when you actually get the thing built because there's stray capacitance and other kind of stuff that you hadn't actually bargained on. But we can tweak that. That's not a problem. But the question still remains then, how do we choose this value? Well, to do that, we're going to use our friend Uncle Google. Now, if you go into Google and just put resonant frequency calculator, then you'll find a whole bunch of these, um, which are great. You can work it out the long way if you want and plug figures into equations, but you know, hey, why reinvent the wheel? So this is just one I found, and this is at goodcalculators.com. And uh, so all you do is you put your inductance and your capacitance in and it will work out the resonant frequency or you can just put the inductance and the resonant frequency and it will tell you the capacitance etc etc um, so you need to know what, what you want to do so um, what I did I knew what my inductance is well the two extreme values so I've got a 6.65 to 7.35 and so 7.35 is the upper limit of the uh, inductance but that will actually give me the lower limit of the frequency range. And you can see I've already been messing around with this. And uh, by trial and error, um, I calculated 7.35 in parallel with 71 picofarads. And I, again, it was just trial and error. I started with 100 picofarads, went up, went down, until I, I got something that's right. For the lower end of the tuning range, comes to 6.97, really, uh, megahertz. So ideal. So just below the bottom of the CW end of the 40 meter band. So that's great. Now, okay, well, what, what about the other end then? So this will be our, our lower 
inductance value but our higher frequency value. So that was 6.65. Six point six five Mike Henry's in power was seventy one picofarads. Calculate. Well, look at that seven point three two. So that's ideal. So that will give me uh, the whole of the forty meter band. No worries whatsoever. So back at the bench, um, I have made up my board. So uh, it's the usual uh, single sided. Uh, copper clad board FR4 and uh, as you should probably see here uh, I buy it, in, it twice this size actually just cut it in half uh, if it's a smaller uh, module like this and then go over it with very fine uh, wire wool just to take off any enamel any lacquer that might be on it and then test it with a multimeter to make sure that uh, you've got a good uh, conductive ground plane then um, you uh, need to work out where you want all your little conductive um, isolated uh, pads uh, and that's what um, I do here if I just swish over to here um, for a moment and um, so you will see I'm going to get this stone um, uh, that's what all these little um, uh, pads are here on my little diagram. What I would just draw your attention to is the voltage regulator. Because Farhan's design, the, the signal flow moves from right to left, which is kind of backwards <laughs> from my way of looking at it. Normally I'd always work the other way around. But it's because it's part of a much larger schematic for his whole transceiver. Um, so what that means is... It, the, the way I've marked that L7805 voltage regulator is misleading. So if you were to just put it on um, with the, the uh, face up, as it were, it would be backwards because actually on an L7805, it, the pin on the left is the in and the pin on the out. Uh, the pin on the right is the out and the ground's in the middle. So if you were to do it like that, you'd have to put it backwards. With the, um, You'd have to glue it down. Well, you, you could stand it upright and turn it round, I guess. But if you were going to glue it down to the ground plane, you'd have to uh, reverse it so that it was face down to make that work. Now, I've chosen a different method. So uh, what I've done is, is I've just skewed the thing round a bit. So um, hang on, let's get this to focus again. There we are. So uh, what I've done is I've actually got the um, the thing lying down the right way, but I I just know that this is the the in and this is the out. So I've skewed the whole thing round, if you see what I mean, um, ninety degrees to the right. So uh, so that actually works then um, because it means that this pin here, um, this uh, pad here, sorry. Uh, is the one that's going to have the 100 ohm resistor uh, across here so that's the uh, that is actually the out of the um of the voltage regulator so uh, anyway i hope that's clear but um i thought i'd mention it because um if you put your voltage regulator around the wrong way uh, it, it ain't going to work too well and so all i've done so far is just put the voltage regulator on and the uh you know associated um uh, capacitors with it so now I will get to work and, um, and populate the rest of the board uh, and I've got to build my RF choke 10 turns on an uh, FT3743 and I'll show you when it's done. So it is completed, well almost completed. Um, so uh, yeah. Uh, if you do your planning, it comes together pretty quickly. All these um, capacitors here, this one here, these three here, these are all my 71 uh, picofarads parallel capacitance, which will go uh, 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 in parallel with the uh, with the coil. Um, so obviously I've got no um, connections. I need power to the voltage regulator, uh, and I need um, the RF out coming from here and I need the connections 
uh, obviously from the coil. Um, yes, which brings me to the next bit. So that's done, and that's going to go in to an enclosure. So and there is the enclosure. So let me just uh, try and get this to focus. Marvellous. So this is the enclosure. Um, now, it was an old one, a bit... <laughs> battered and bruised really um, that I had something else in um, but I managed to secure it so uh, put a bracket uh, in the end there of the cap secured it underneath um, and that's okay um, so that you can kind of turn this and that's fine that's absolutely fine um, it already had because from a previous project a BNC so I can use that as the RF out and it already had um, a power socket, so I've just rewired uh, that. So the actual board um, is going to fit in, uh, in a moment, something a bit like this. Um, something a bit like that. And I'll wire those things in. And, uh, yeah, then we can uh, uh, put it on the bench and, uh, and uh, try it out. So here is the final uh, thing. Um, now in the end, I found I needed uh, more parallel capacitance. So I'd um, calculated 71, in the end I went for 75. And the only way you can do that really is by um, trying it and seeing what your tuning range is and then, um, uh, you know, uh, adding more capacitance, taking capacitance off, you know, until you get it right. Um, so it's just trial and error. Um, but yeah, so um, anyway, so uh, this is it. And uh, let's measure it and see how well it performs. Right, okay, so what you're looking at is um, a, a screen grab, if you like, um, a real-time screen grab of uh, my Spectrum Analyzer screen. Um, and so you can see all those harmonics, all those odd harmonics, and it's exactly what you would expect. So the the green little triangle on the on peak number one. If you look at the peak table down below, um, so that is the, uh, the the main frequency that we're producing, um, and then all the odd harmonics after that. So uh, we're we're at seven point two. So we're at um, you know fourteen, uh, then and twenty one. 30 etc um, so but just to, to show you what it looks like um, that's a hundred megahertz sweep from one megahertz to a hundred uh, so what we're going to do now is we're going to uh, just uh, zoom in on on the one uh, that we're interested in which is at 7.2 at the moment okay so I've zoomed right in so this entire span you're seeing is just one kilohertz wide. So each one of those divisions is a hundred hertz. And as you can see at this resolution, um, we've got some drift um, as you would expect with, with any analog um, oscillator, but not very much. I mean, I, I you know, built how I got into to, to amateur radio home brewing was was building VFOs with with uh, uh, variable capacitors and fixed uh, inductors, and I mean some of the drift I would have was ju um, the, the things were just unusable really, whereas this is quite amazing really, uh, and I haven't even given it a fighting chance by letting it warm up for for. 10-15 minutes or something I've just kind of switched it on and, and seen what it's doing so it is remarkably stable um, I'm sure that's partly due to the construction it's partly due to the uh, the NP0 capacitors um, but yeah but the glue stick uh, variable inductor seems to, um, uh, to, to do pretty well um, so yeah, the proof of the pudding will be in the eating, as they say. So this whole um, permeability-tuned oscillator will be 
forming part of uh, a direct conversion receiver, which I'm revisiting uh, again. Um, but this time it, it's going to be an all analog uh, uh, DCR. So I've not done that before. I've only ever had um, all the tuning done by an SI5351 with an Arduino and a rotary encoder and an LCD screen and all, all of that. Well, I'm not doing any of that. None of it, you know. Um, it, it's going to be uh, powered by this glue stick uh, PTO. And uh, so uh, it will be interesting to see, you know, how it, how it fares um, on the air. Um, because there's a little bit of drift there. Um, but it, at the moment, you see, we've, uh, we've drifted about 50 hertz, I suppose, in, in the time that um, uh, we've been talking. And uh, so, you know, you're going to get some drift, but, but I'm amazed, really, at, at how little drift um, there, there actually is. And, uh, and we're seeing it because I've zoomed right into this, this resolution because I wanted you to see it, uh, kind of warts uh, and all. Um, but no, very impressed um, with that. So um, uh, there it is. So the next thing will be to, um, uh, to combine it with some other modules and uh, and listen to, uh, to to what it sounds like in a real radio but that will be a video for another day thing i just quickly wanted to show you was the tuning range that we've got so now i've fully retracted the the coil so it's it's kind of screwed all the way out as it were now um which will give us our upper frequency and you can see there it's sat at 7.3 megahertz so um yeah, that's a good uh, 100 kilohertz above the uh, the top of the UK allocation, um, and I'm just going to um, uh, tune down now, and you'll you'll see how far uh, we we get. So up um, here, oh, yeah, going the wrong way. That's never a good sign. Okay, so if I just tune along, tune along. Part of that jerkiness is actually the uh, the screen. Actually, so on the uh, the actual real screen, it's, uh, it's it's a little bit smoother than this. So I'm still going all the way down to there. Six point nine eight. So that's great. So the whole of uh, the uh, the seven. Uh, megahertz uh, allocation, the whole of the 40 meter band, um, we can tune. Great stuff. Now I know what some of you are thinking. Well that's fine for you with your fancy schmancy spectrum analyzer, but what if you haven't got a spectrum analyzer, how do you measure this thing? Well that's a very good question and for most of my life I haven't had a spectrum analyzer, that's a very recent acquisition. Um, but you don't need one. Um, uh, the crucial thing is to see your signal in the frequency domain. Uh, but I want to show you now two other ways in which you can do that for a lot less financial outlay uh, than a spectrum analyzer. One way uh, is you can use one of these, a tiny SA. And uh, it's kind of like a brother to the nano VNA, really. Um, and useful little thing, costs about 50 or 60 pounds, and um, yeah, well, I'll, I'll repeat the exercise, you can see uh, we're uh, about 7.3 there, if I start, oh, going the wrong way, that's always, uh, <laughs> I always go the wrong way, okay, so, so you can see now, that's it, we're going down, we're going down, we're going down. You can also see that the, um, the, the level is fairly constant as well uh, of, uh, of what we're doing here. Uh, down, down, there we are, gone too far, gone past the uh, lowest point, there. So um, yeah, you can do it. Uh, using uh, a tiny SA. Or, thirdly, you can use one of these. 
um, an SDR play, uh, RSP, this is an RSP2, they're discontinued now, but you can get an RSP1A or something. Um, superb, costs about £100, I think. Um, just one of the best bits of kit any radio amateur can have in their shack, I would have to say. Rarely do I use it. It's a very good software-defined radio receiver, um, and you can use it to tune all kinds of stuff. But most of the time, I use it as a piece of test equipment, and you'll see I've got a little tiny bit of wire um, coming out of the uh, the high Z input, and I've I'm not even physically connecting it to the uh, PTO. It's just sat on top of it. That is enough, and uh, I will show you now um, that same exercise uh, on the screen now of uh, Cubic SDR running on my Mac. So here is the relevant range um, that we can see as uh, displayed on my uh, computer screen and uh, I haven't got anything. You can actually hear it as well if you really wanted to. Um, and you can see there, look at that, it's a lovely sine wave. So yeah, that's great. I'm not going to bother with that. So, um, but I'll just move this out of the way. Um, but just have a look. I'm just going to tune and just see what happens as I tune. There we go. There we go. And so um, you can do all of that um, without the use of uh, a spectrum analyzer. And there is even a free bit of software, Windows software actually, that runs um, with the, uh, the SDR Play units to simulate a spectrum analyzer. So um, yeah, you're not stumped uh, if you don't have a spectrum analyzer by any means. Well, there we go, a permeability tuned oscillator using a glue stick. I mean, who knew? <laughs> so, fantastic. Uh, as you say, I built a couple. I'm probably going to build a lot more. Um, give it a go yourselves. Um, see how you get on. What a great idea. Cheers, Bill. Fantastic. And uh, thank you to Paul Clark as well, I think, who was the, uh, the, the original person who came up with this uh, cracking idea so um get the uh, the irons uh, hot and uh, and and, uh, and get the glue sticks out and uh, i'll see you on the next video until then 73 take care bye bye